Okay, welcome everybody. This is chapter 9, where we will review the senses. We're going to first discuss the general senses by listing the types of sensory receptors found in the skin and specify the functions of each. We'll explain the role of barrow and chemoreceptors in homeostasis. Then we'll have a discussion of the special senses, where we'll describe the structures of the external, middle, and internal ear and explain how they function. We'll describe the functions of the hair cells in the semicircular ducts, the utricle and saccule, and explain their role in responding to gravity and linear acceleration. We'll identify the accessory structures of the eye and explain their functions and define conjunctivitis. And we'll explain how light is directed to the fovea of the retina. So the job of receptors is the change of physical experience in our environment, whether that be temperature, light, smell, sound, taste, into electrical information that can be sent back to the central nervous system and eventually up to the brain stem in the brain where the brain will label that sensation as to what it is and where it's located and then integrate all the sensory information send it to the frontal lobe of the brain and then we decide on a plan of action to respond to that stimulus. The plan of action is then sent to the cerebral cortex in an area called the motor cortex which is on the precentral gyrus of the brain. That information is then sent to the basal nuclei and the cerebellum and then eventually down to the brain stem, down the spinal cord and out the efferent root, which is going to be the ventral root of the spinal cord, to the spinal nerves, and then from there, there are going to be nerve cells that carry that electrical information all the way to the effector, and that will cause us to perform some kind of action. So these receptors are designed to change physical sensation into electrical information and their endings, their cell shapes, their cell adaptations show how that happens. So sensitivity to temperature, pain, touch, pressure, and vibration and proprioception is provided by our general senses. They're picked up by sensory receptors which are specialized cells or processes. The simplest are dendrites of sensory neurons which we call free nerve endings that are stimulated by many different stimuli such as chemical pressure and temperature. They have little receptor specificity and you can see examples of what they look like here where these free nerve endings originate in the dermis. This is dermis down here to orient you. So this is dermis. and they terminate in the epidermis. Okay. And what they're going to do is they're going to change the sensation experienced with the release of certain chemicals, the physical sensation of change in pressure and temperature into electrical information that will be sent from these nerve endings to these nerves and then ultimately that's going to travel back to the central nervous system first the spinal cord and then that's going to head up to the brain which is also a CNS structure. We can classify general sensory receptors according to the nature of their primary stimulus. Nociceptors detect pain and they have large receptive fields and a broad sensitivity. 
They're made up of type A and C fibers, which carry the pain sensation. Remember, the type A fibers are the quickest, and type C are some of the slowest. Thermoreceptors are temperature receptors that are located in the dermis, in the skeletal muscle, in the liver, and the hypothalamus. Cold receptors are three to four times more numerous than warm receptors, and we should also point out that the distribution of these receptors differs. We have a lot more of the warm receptors on our posterior than on our anterior, and we have a lot more of these receptors located in the fingertips and the toes and the soles of the feet, the palms of the hands, than we do in other places on the body. Mechanoreceptors are sensitive to plasma membrane changes that result from stretching, compression, twisting, or other mechanical distortion. It turns those mechanical changes into electrical information, while proprioceptors monitor the position of joints and muscles and inform the brain and brainstem of the body's position in space. Baroreceptors detect pressure changes in the walls of blood vessels and in portions of different tracts throughout our internal organs, while tactile receptors provide a sensation of touch, pressure, and vibration that can be relayed back to the brain, and chemoreceptors respond to substances that are dissolved in body fluids. So what are some of the roles for these different receptors? Well. We can outline a few here for baroreceptors, okay? Baroreceptors are going to regulate things like blood pressure, okay? Proprioreceptors are going to have a role in regulating our equilibrium, our balance. Tactile receptors provide a sensation of touch, pressure, and vibration. And chemoreceptors respond to substances dissolved in body fluids. So examples of chemoreceptive senses would include things like taste and smell. You can see some of these receptors here. Notice that the nerve endings differ depending on the modality that they are designed to transmit back to the central nervous system. They have the greatest diversity of the general sensory receptors. Tactile sensitivity can be altered by infection, disease, or damage to sensory neurons or pathways. Tactile responses are used for diagnosis. Sensory loss along a dermatome boundary can help identify an affected spinal nerve or nerves. And so this might add, lead you to ask, okay, with these general sensory receptors that respond, in this case, to physical change, what, what are we talking about when we're talking about a dermatome? Okay, so this is... These are varieties of mechanoreceptors, right? So if we list them here, free nerve endings primarily responding to pain with regard to, you know, pressure on the skin, okay? Hair shaft, root, hair plexis, going to be light touch. Tactile discs, light touch and vibration. Tactile corpuscle, light pressure. Lamellated corpuscle, deep pressure. and Ruffini corpuscle touch. 
A dermatome, if we were to draw sort of a outline of the body here, Again, forgive my art, but a dermatome represents an area on the surface of the skin of the body that is innervated by a spinal nerve, okay, and so they sort of move across the body in bands, like so, and there are consecutive spinal nerves that innervate overlapping areas that we know as dermatomes. Okay. So these are important in surgery as we have to deaden consecutive spinal nerves in order to lose complete sensation in a certain area of the skin. Okay. And they are also relevant with regard to pain. if we lose sensation across a particular dermatome that indicates which spinal nerves are likely affected so we can use this as a diagnostic to determine perhaps a disease process or physical trauma that may have damaged nerve leads to a specific area of the skin free nerve endings contain branching tips of sensory neurons they're not protected and nonspecific and respond to tactile sensation, that's touch, pain, and temperature stimuli. And so you can see examples of these free nerve endings here. They're most common receptors found in the skin. Root hair plexuses monitor distortions and movements across the body surface. As the hair is displaced, the movement of the follicle distorts the sensory dendrites and produces action potentials that are sent back to the central nervous system. This is one of the many roles of the the hair on our on our skin is it produces the sensation of touch. Tactile discs respond to fine touch and pressure receptors. Dendrites in the afferent fiber are in contact with specialized epithelial cells in the dermis. Tactile corpuscles, also called Meissner corpuscles, provide sensations of fine touch and pressure and low frequency vibration and adapt to stimulation within a second, so they're what are called rapid adapting. They're most abundant in the eyelids, the lips, the fingertips, the nipples, and the external genitalia. They contain coiled and interwoven dendrites that are surrounded by modified Schwann cells, and so you can see Again, an, an inset here, looking at the ending of these tactile corpuscles. Notice that most of them are located in the area between the beginning of the epidermis and the end of the dermis, in the papillary layer. The fibrous capsule surrounds the entire complex and anchors it within the dermis. Pacinian corpuscles, also known as lamellated corpuscles, are sensitive to deep pressure. They're most sensitive to pulsing or high-frequency vibration. They contain a single dendrite wrapped in concentric layers of collagen fiber and specialized fibroblasts and are located in the dermis, the mammary glands, and external genitalia. And they're also found in mesentery, pancreas, and walls of the urethra and the urinary bladder. Ruffini corpuscles are sensitive to pressure and distortion of the deep dermis. Little, if any, adaptation is exhibited by these specific receptors. Adaptation is defined as a reduction in sensitivity to constant stimulus. They have a network of dendrites that are intertwined with collagen. They are surrounded by a capsule. Distortion of the dermis tugs and twists at the capsule fibers. The dendrites in turn get stretched or compressed, and this sends a message along the afferent fiber.
baroreceptors are stretch receptors that monitor changes in pressure. They're made up of free nerve endings with, that branch within elastic tissue. The pressure changes stretch or recoil the elastic tissues and the change in the tissue distorts the branches of the receptor which alters the rate of action potential generation. Where do we find these baroreceptors? Well, in parts of the body that require information related to stretch in order to maintain homeostasis. So in the carotid and aortic sinuses they monitor blood pressure. Information that is sent by these baroreceptors plays a role in regulating cardiac function and adjusting the blood flow and thus adjusting the blood pressure. The lungs monitor the degree of lung expansion. The information is sent to the respiratory centers to control breathing rate and breathing rhythm. While in the colon, they monitor the volume of fecal matter and trigger de defecation. And in the digestive tract, they monitor the volume of material in the digestive tract and trigger reflex movements that we know as peristalsis, which are smooth muscle contraction that propels food along the digestive tract. They're found in the urinary bladder wall where they monitor volume and trigger urination. Chemoreceptors detect small changes in concentrations of specific chemicals or compounds and play a role in the reflexive control of respiration and cardiovascular function. So one of the things they detect, for instance, is alterations in blood pH or in the pH of the fluid between cells. It can't be allowed to get too high or too low because you'll create a toxic condition that will cause proteins to denature, that will change membrane potential, and thus cause cell function to cease. They're found within the medulla oblongata where they monitor the pH and carbon dioxide levels in the cerebrospinal fluid and in the carotid bodies where they monitor pH, CO2 and oxygen levels in the blood and in the aortic bodies where they monitor pH, CO2 and oxygen levels in the blood as well. Special senses are a little bit different. They're usually housed in special sense organs, such as the eyes, the inner ear, the tongue. They're more structurally complex than the receptors for the general senses. The information is distributed to specific areas in the cerebral cortex, such as the auditory cortex of the brain on the temporal lobe receiving information from the cochlea and the visual cortex of the brain on the occipital lobe receiving information from the retina of the eye, just to name a couple of examples. There are five special senses, and they include olfaction, which is the sense of smell, vision, the sense of sight, gustation, the sense of taste, equilibrium, our sense of balance, and hearing. So let's start with olfaction and taste. Olfactory sensory receptors are modified neurons, while gustation sensory receptors are specialized receptor cells that communicate with sensory neurons. Both olfaction and gustation have sensory receptors in the epithelia and are exposed to the environment, and the information is routed directly to the central nervous system for processing. As a result of this, these receptors are frequently replaced. Due to their exposure to the outside world, they incur damage. And as a result, in order to retain our sense of smell and our sense of taste, we have to produce new olfactory and gustatory receptors periodically. When we're talking about hearing and equilibrium, we're dealing with structures in the inner ear. Sensory receptors are protected from the external environment in the internal ear. Sensory information is integrated and organized before it's forwarded to the central nervous system. These receptors are known as hair cells. Their free surfaces are covered with processes that are similar to microvilli. 
The mechanoreceptors are surrounded by supporting cells and monitored by dendrites of sensory neurons. And in the cochlea, which is the organ of hearing, the distorting force is a sound wave. In the vestibular apparatus, the distorting force is gravity. And in the semicircular canals, the distorting force is movement in one of the three planes, sagittal, transverse, or frontal, or a combination of any of those movements. This external force distorts the hair cell. This distorts the plasma membrane and alters the rate of chemical transmitter release to the sensory neuron. Here you can see an example of the apparatus that responds to movement in the transverse, sagittal, or frontal plane, or a movement that is between those planes. We're looking here at the semicircular canals. They contain hair cells that respond to rotation. And there are three ducts that we can see, the anterior, the posterior, and the lateral duct. Each duct has an ampulla, which is the expanded region of the duct that empties into the vestibule. The receptors in the specific region of the ampulla are called the crista ampullaris, and they contain hair cells that are embedded in the cupula, which is a flexible, elastic, gelatinous structure that, as we see, responds to the movement of a fluid called endolymph across its surface, which makes these hair cells bend. This produces neurotransmitter release that is interpreted by the brain as movement in one of the three planes. Okay, looking at the movement of endolymph in the ampulla of the semicircular canals, we see the mechanism whereby movement of the body in either the sagittal, the transverse, or the frontal plane can be turned into a physical change that will reflect a change in membrane potential on the part of the receptor cells that will be ultimately transmitted via the vestibular branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve back to the brain and give us our sense of balance. The cupula floats in the endolymph above the crista ampullaris and movement of the head will cause movement of the endolymph and that will cause the cupula to tip to one side or the other and this distorts the receptor processes and this will open ion gates. Movement in one direction stimulates hair cells. Movement in the opposite direction will inhibit the hair cells. <clears throat> Stopping rotational movement stops the movement of the endolymph and the cupula returns to its normal position and that information gets transmitted back to the brain as no movement. The three semicircular ducts lie in three rotational planes and each responds to one rotational movement. Horizontal rotation, such as when you shake your head no, stimulates receptors in the lateral semicircular duct. Vertical rotation, such as nodding your head yes, stimulates receptors in the anterior semicircular duct. And tilting the head to the side will stimulate receptors in the posterior semicircular duct. Now, in addition to the semicircular canals providing us a means for determining our dynamic equilibrium, we also have structures in the utricle and the saccule of the vestibule, which are called maculae. Hair cells here are embedded in a gelatinous otolithic membrane. The otoliths are like tiny crystals that respond to the pull of gravity. The utricle is sensitive to changes in horizontal movement, while the saccule is sensitive to changes in vertical movement. Okay, so this will tell you whether you're moving back and forth or up and down. So this is 
why we refer to it as your static equilibrium. You're moving in one direction. You're not spinning, okay? But it still informs the brain of movement. This also helps us to keep our balance. With the head upright, the otoliths on top of the otolithic membrane simply sit, okay? With the head upright, you're going to have one set of otoliths that will experience the pull of gravity and one set of otoliths um, and, and the result of that will be a tilting of the hair cells and then the other set of otoliths that are going to be um, essentially oriented horizontally they won't bend with the pull of gravity. It's only when the head is going to tilt that they will experience this change. The weight presses down on the macular surface and it pushes the hair cell processes down with the head upright. With the head tilted, gravity is going to pull on the otoliths. They'll shift to one side. The movement distorts the hair cell processes and it stimulates receptors. And we get the perception of linear acceleration. The otoliths lag behind, giving the effect of tilting the head. Okay, So this is how we feel like we're moving up and down or back and forth. And so this is why we call this your, your static equilibrium, okay? because you're not spinning. Okay, the other major role for the organs of the inner ear is to turn sound into electrical information that can be piped back to the temporal lobe of the brain so that it can be interpreted as noise or as speech. The organ that does this is called the cochlea. It's a long coiled tube suspended between two chambers that are filled with paralymph. There are inside the cochlea two different sets of chambers, one called the scala vestibuli and one called the scala tympani. A bony labyrinth encases all three ducts except at the oval window, which is at the base of the scala vestibuli and the round window, which is at the base of the scala tympani. So if you want to envision these, these two chambers, okay, the scala vestibuli is going to start closest to the eardrum and proceed away from it all the way to the tip of the cochlea, which is a coiled structure. It looks a bit like a snail shell. While the scala tympani is going to start at the tip of the cochlea and work its way all the way back towards the, um, the eardrum. Hair cells in the cochlear duct in this structure are called the spiral organ or the organ of corti which runs the length of the cochlea. And what happens when sound hits the eardrum is that little bones called ossicles will vibrate because they're attached to the eardrum, they're on the medial side of the drum. As the ossicles move, they're going to pound on the oval window. That, in turn, is going to move the paralymph inside the cochlea. And that movement will be translated to the endolymph, which is going to be right next to the spiral organ. Those vibrations in the endolymph are going to cause the platform on which these hair cells sit to move up and down. As they move up and down, there's a tiny membrane called the tectoral membrane in which these hair cells are embedded. And as these cells move up and down, the stereocilia will tilt and that will open ion gates and produce a change in membrane potential that will be transmitted via the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve back to the temporal lobe of the brain where we'll perceive it and then we'll label it as noise or as speech. So this is a look at how the entire apparatus works. Sound waves are gathered by the pinna and directed down the auditory canal to the eardrum or tympanic membrane. The mechanical energy of the sound causes the eardrum to vibrate. This in turn causes vibration of the three middle ear bones. 
first the malleus, then the incus, and finally the stapes. These tiny bones amplify the vibrations. The stapes comes in contact with the inner ear at the oval window. The fluid-filled inner ear is a coiled structure called the cochlea. Vibrations conveyed to the fluid cause bending of hair cells. If we examine this cross-section of the cochlea, the tectorial membrane can be seen at the top. In it are embedded the tips of hair cells, which are shown circled in yellow. When the hair cells bend in response to vibration, the rate of firing by the neurons at their bases changes. These signals are conveyed to the brain and perceived as sound. And perceived. Okay, the eyes are the organs that help us see. There are accessory structures that aid the eyes in this task. The eyelashes help prevent foreign matter from reaching the eye surface. Well, the eyelids, known as the palpebra, are a continuation of the skin. Blinking of the eyelids keeps the eye surface lubricated, and it also removes dust and debris and protects the surface of the eye. The importance of lubricating the eye is so that the cornea of the eye, which is the clear skin right in front of the pupil here, can get oxygen. You have to remember that this is one of the few parts of the body where the blood supply does not provide the oxygen and so we have to get it from the air. The palpable fissure is the gap that separates the upper and lower eyelids and is connected by the medial here and the lateral canthus. The lacrimal carnucle is the location of the glands that produce thick secretions that wash across the eye. Your tears, if we go back here, are actually produced by the lacrimal glands in the superior lateral portion of the orbit. They wash across the surface of the eye and then they drain into the lacrimal puncta, down the lacrimal duct, into the lacrimal sac, and into the nose. This is one of the reasons why when you cry, your nose runs. The purpose, again, of the tears is to moisten, and lubricate, and remove foreign matter from the surface of the eye. The conjunctiva is an epithelia that covers the inner surface of the eyelids and the outer surface of the eye. It's a mucous membrane that's covered by specialized stratified squamous epithelia. Continuous with the epithelial covering surface of the cornea, um, the conjunctiva moves all the way down to where the white of the eye abuts what we would call the iris. Okay, so if we wanted to diagram where this membrane is located, let's do this in blue. Okay, what we would see here is that it runs from here back and down all the way to here, okay, where the blue line is. It has blood vessels. Tarsal glands or meibomian glands are modified sebaceous glands on the inner margin of each eyelid and they secrete a lipid-rich secretion that keeps the eyelids from sticking together. Now occasionally the conjunctiva can become inflamed as a result of infection or exposure to irritants and we call this condition conjunctivitis which you know more colloquially as pink eye. The tears are produced by the lacrimal glands and they reduce friction when you blink. They remove debris <clears throat> and prevent bacterial infection because they contain compounds such as lysozyme and antibodies. Lysozyme is an enzyme that dissolves the cell walls of bacteria, thus weakening them when they're in a hypoosmotic solution, <clears throat> causing the rupture and die. And of course the antibodies are proteins that are designed to attach to and initiate the destruction of pathogens. The tears also provide nutrients and oxygen to the conjunctival epithelium. And here you can see the accessory organs of the orbit 
with most of the skin removed. So, again, the lacrimal gland produces, distributes, and removes tears. The lacrimal gland or tear gland is associated with ducts. The almond-shaped gland produces about a milliliter of tears daily. The tear ducts deliver the tears from the lacrimal gland to the space behind the upper eyelid. Well, the lacrimal puncta are small pores that drain the lacrimal lake where the tears collect. And the lacrimal canaliculi are small canals that collect the lacrimal puncta into the lacrimal sac, which nestles in the lacrimal sulcus of the orbit. A nasolacrimal duct carries the tears from the lacrimal sac to the inferior meatus of the nasal cavity, and that is where they're expelled. And so the whole point of this, again, is to protect and moisten the eye and allow the cornea, which has no blood vessels of its own, to get oxygen from the air. Conjunctivitis, also known as pink eye, results from damage to and irritation of the conjunctival surface. Redness comes from dilated blood vessels deep to the conjunctival epithelium. It's caused by pathogenic infection and physical, allergic, or chemical irritation. Um, this generally results in the release of a compound called histamine, and that promotes vasodilation, causes the capillaries to become leaky, and allows white blood cells to enter the area where the histamine's been released so that it can battle potential infection. So essentially a mechanism by the body that allows us to more effectively keep us well. In addition to that, of course, it's also quite painful, and this is a warning to you that there's an area in the body that needs to be cared for and treated. Okay, so let's take a look at the way the eye is set up. The cornea is the clear skin in the front of the eye, about dead center, that allows light entry into the eye. It runs from the sclera, which is the white of the eye, all the way to the pupil, which is the hole through which light enters the eyeball and is surrounded by the iris. It's a dense matrix of multiple layers of collagen and keratin fibers. It has no blood vessels, it gets nutrients from tears, and it gets oxygen, of course, from the air. The lens is behind the cornea. It's held in place by suspensory ligaments that are connected to the ciliary body. Tension on these ligaments keeps the lens less than spherical. And so what we have to appreciate about the lens is that it can change its shape depending on whether you're trying to focus on something close to or far away from the eyes. The closer an object is, and if you're attempting to focus on it, the shorter and fatter the lens will become. And that's so that you can decrease the focal length so that it comes into focus exactly on the sweet spot in the back of the eye known as the fovea centralis of the retina. And if you're looking at an object that's further away, what will happen is the lens will become longer and flatter, and that will allow the rays of light that are coming from the object to focus again on the sweet spot of the retina in sharp focus. As we get older, this becomes more difficult to do when we focus on things close up, the lens becomes stiffer and less easy to change its shape, and that's a condition known as presbyopia, and that's one of the reasons why we need reading glasses as we get older. The retina contains photoreceptors, supporting cells, and neurons, and the job of the retina is to change the light stimulus into electrical information that gets piped back through the optic nerve, past the optic chiasm and the optic tracts, to the thalamus of the brain, which then projects back to the occipital lobe of the brain on the back of your head, where we interpret that as vision and we are able to label the components of that stimulus as color. The choroid contains nutrient-carrying blood vessels and is the, the middle layer of the eyeball, and the sclera is part of the fibrous tunic it's the white of the eye, and it's made up of dense, fibrous, connective tissue and stabilizes the shape of the eye. 
and it also serves as the insertion point for the extrinsic eye muscles. Light passes through the center of the cornea and the center of the lens to a specific location on the retina. An imaginary line from the center of the object through the center of the cornea and the lens to the retina is called the visual axis. The highest concentration of photoreceptors on the retina is at the fovea in an area known as the macula lutea. Okay, so our greatest visual acuity is in this region of the retina which is populated mostly by special types of photoreceptors known as cones. This is our area of greatest visual acuity because it's also our area of greatest density of cones. The fovea is the site of sharpest vision. The second cranial nerve, known as the optic nerve, gathers the information that's transmitted from the photoreceptors to the bipolar cells, to the ganglion cells of the retina, that ultimately converge into the optic nerve which allows it to be carried back to the optic chiasm, from there to the thalamus of the brain, and from there to the occipital lobe of the brain. So let's take a look at how vision operates. To form images of our environment, light emitted by or reflected from objects must be focused on the retina. Some of the light reflected from the surface of a yield sign is directed toward the eye. Upon reaching the eye, the light is first refracted by the cornea to send it on a path toward the retina. To reach the retina, the light rays must pass through the lens where a small amount of refraction adjusts the angle of the light to form a focused image on the retina. Central to the sense of vision is the transduction of light energy into electrical energy by cells in the retina called rods and cones. Cylindrical shaped cells called rods are responsible for the perception of light and dark. Conically shaped cells called cones are sensitive to red, green, or blue light. Okay, this is a look at how the pupil regulates the passage of light into the eyeball. The amount of light entering the eye is controlled by two layers of smooth muscle located in the iris, and they're controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Remember that the autonomic nervous system has two divisions. The sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system is our fight or flight division and it kicks in when we're in a panic situation. And the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system is known as the rest and digest division and it is active most of the rest of the time and puts the body in a fuel storage and maintenance mode. So, um, the pupillary dilator muscles are going to be activated by sympathetic innervation and also by dim light and they act to increase the pupillary diameter that lets more light into the eye and that allows us um, to see in dim light more easily and this in re regards to the fight or flight response will probably enhance our ability to get out of danger. The pupillary constrictor muscles are activated by parasympathetic innervation and bright light and they decrease the pupillary diameter. And so it's important for us to understand that when we're talking about the eye and the passage of light through the eye, that we be very clear about the shape of the eyeball and how the light gets back there. So if we're looking at the eyeball edge on, okay, and this would be the cornea, and this would be the lens, okay, and this back here would be the retina. What happens is that light from an object, let's just make the object the letter M, will pass through the cornea where it will be bent in a process known as refraction. It will then enter what we call the anterior chamber which is filled with aqueous humor. It's kind of a liquid that comes as a filtrate of blood. This will further bend the light and then it will hit the lens and then it will go into the vitreous humor which is the clear jelly-like fluid that allows the eyeball to keep its shape 
the truth's humor, and further refracts the light. So there's four transparent layers that light has to go through in order to get to the back of the eye. And then the image that, that will be produced on the retina will be uh, flipped left to right and top to bottom. You have to go through the clear cornea, the clear aqueous, the clear lens, and the clear vitreous in order to get all the way to the retina. And anything that interferes with that is going to interfere with your ability to see. The amount of light that gets into the eye is regulated by the muscles that regulate the pupillary diameter, as we just discussed. And the object of focusing on a, on a, a shape that we're trying to make out is to get the light rays to converge on the sweet spot of the retina, which is the fovea centralis. Now what happens in some people is that they have difficulty seeing objects clearly due to problems with the shape of the eyeball or with the surface of the cornea or with the um, consistency and shape of the lens. Some examples include cataract. In cataract what happens is that either the cornea or the lens becomes cloudy and light when it hits it instead of bending will tend to scatter and that makes it very difficult to see. We can fix this um, corneal cataract, we can do a corneal transplant. In the case of a cloudy lens, we can replace the lens with an artificial one and restore the ability to see. In some people, we have a problem focusing the image properly and that can be due to differences in the shape of the eyeball. For instance, in people who are myopic, one of the things that we noticed is that either the optical components of the eyeball or the shape of the eyeball, now I'm exaggerating a bit here, are such that the object's light rays come into focus before it makes it all the way to the back of the eyeball. And so what happens by the time the image gets back to the retina is that it's blurry. Okay, so the object will come in. I'll draw the lens here. Okay. And it'll, it'll come into focus before it makes it to the retina. And then when it gets to the retina, it's blurry. Okay, so this is myopia. And we fix this either by changing the shape of the cornea using laser corrective surgery, or we use lenses that, if you looked at them on the side, would have a shape kind of like this, where they're thick at the edges and thin in the middle. And what that's called is a concave lens. And what that does to the light rays that are coming from the object you're trying to focus on is it actually bends them in the opposite direction so that when they hit the, the lens, the, either your contact lens or the lens in your glasses, they, they move away from midline. And then when they hit the, um, the myopic eye, the focal length is adjusted so that it comes into focus just right on the fovea centralis of your retina. Okay, So that's myopia. In hyperopia, which we call farsightedness, either the optical components of the eye or the shape of the eyeball is such that when you look at the object, this is hyperopia, the object comes into focus behind the retina. So it'll bend, it'll bend, and the, the focal point will be back here. Okay, And so we fix that with a lens that's fat in the middle. And what this does is it shortens, this is a convex lens, so either a contact that has this shape or an eyeglass lens that has this shape. This shortens the focal length and the object now comes into focus just right on the back of the retina. And then you've probably also heard of another condition known as astigmatism. And in astigmatism what happens is that either the shape of the cornea or in some cases the shape of the lens is irregular 
and the result is that parts of the image come into focus too soon and parts of the image come into focus too late and the way that we fix that traditionally is bifocals that have a lens that can focus both for close objects and for distant objects. Um, in any of these cases we can use um, laser surgery to change the shape of the cornea since the cornea does most of the light bending if we perform the laser corrective surgery properly you won't need corrective lenses when you're done okay so in the case of myopia what we would do is we would we would engage in corrective surgery that would tend to flatten the cornea and in the case of hyperopia we would have corrective surgery that would cause the cornea to to fatten for lack of a better term so flatten versus fatten and in astigmatism what we would do is we would look at the cornea surface and we would try and remove any grooves or ridges from it and that would allow the image to come into focus just right on the back of the eyeball okay so those are some common um, visual problems and their respective solutions now we should point out that not everybody is a candidate for laser corrective surgery and this is due to the hydrating capability of the tissue that lies underneath the cornea which is called endothelial tissue that's responsible for hydrating the corneal surface from underneath the cornea has moisture that comes both from the front and from the back and if you lack this hydrating action you're not going to be a candidate for laser surgery because the inflammation that will result will cause the hydration of the cornea to be compromised and the result is that the cornea will become cloudy and so at that point what they'll tell you after they take a look at the tissues that are covering the uh, the front of the eye from the from the extreme border of the iris all the way into the pupil that's your cornea if they look at that and they find that you don't have adequate hydrating power then they'll recommend contact lenses or glasses as opposed to laser corrective surgery okay so that brings us to the end of this podcast um, if again if you have any questions make sure and contact me and I will see everybody in the next chapter. Thanks for listening.